everyone, so we'll go ahead and get started now. And like I said, if you need to get up and wanna get more food, get more drinks, please feel free. So I hope you've all enjoyed the first half of the conference. I know I have. Um, so now we're going to have about an hour of hearing from some of our ASU students who actually all teach um, at, well, five of them actually all teach at um, a prison. And then um, one of our other students, Sarah, she hasn't had the opportunity to teach because of her very busy schedule, but she is a pen, part, pen project um, intern, and she has been for many semesters. So she's gonna talk a lot about her experience with that. So, as I said before, my name is Lana Marie Musa. I'm one of the vice presidents of Peace, and I also teach, uh, for the first time this semester, a woman and music class at the Perryville Women's Prison, and we study different um, female artists and study um, their music, their songs, how they got to where they are in a very male-dominated industry, and we also study um, how to sing. We do a lot of singing as well, and the proper way to sing, and um, healthy way to sing. So it's an incredibly fun class, and the students are really enjoying it. So I'm going to pass it over to our panel members um, and hear about their experiences. So we'll start off with, if you guys can just introduce yourselves and talk about the class that you teach and where you teach and how the opportunity came about for you. Um, sure. So my name is Mia Armstrong. Um, I'm a senior here at ASU. I study journalism and global studies. Um, I've been teaching in prisons in Arizona for about two years now. I started at um, Florence, which is a men's prison, and then um, for the last year and a half, I've been at Perryville, which is a women's prison. Um, I teach uh, creative nonfiction writing and journalism, and um, I started with the Pen Project my freshman year. Um, because I kind of have a, a personal experience to um, incarceration. Um, so my uncle had been um, incarcerated and has been incarcerated basically my whole life. And I saw the difference that volunteer-based programming made in his incarceration experience. And so um, that's when I came to ASU and I, I saw the ability to participate in that for um, other people I you know, wanted to participate. So that's kind of why I, why I started. My name is Winter Roth. I'm a biochemistry and psychology double major. Um, I'm actually taking over the panel slot for my co-teacher co in our psychology course right now. She actually went home sick. So I'll kind of try and give some answers that she would answer. But um, I taught business skills at Perryville about a year ago. I teach psychology there now. And I started with the Penn Project my sophomore year. After I was in Dr. Wells's freshman English class, she reached out to me. And I also had a family member incarcerated. So that's why I decided to do the Penn Project. I am Sarah Leon. I am a senior here, and I am majoring in biological sciences with a minor in global health. Um, I have not had the opportunity to teach at any of the prisons due to my schedule, but I have been a Penn Project intern since um, my sophomore year, I think it's my fifth semester doing it. Um, I was actually in <laughs> Winter's English class with Corey, and um, I'm actually glad Corey mentioned that she got started with this due to do a, a chance conversation and a chance encounter, because that's how I got brought into this. Um, after our semester with her, she had a conversation with me, and it just sounded like a great opportunity to um, help other people explore their voice, so that really drew me into the program. Hi everyone, my name is Nathan. I'm a biomedical engineering major. Um, I've been, this is my second semester teaching at the prison. I taught uh, beginning Chinese last semester. And then this semester I'm co-teaching a class titled Popular Culture and Rhetoric with Colleen. Um, I got involved, um, Corey reached out to me in my freshman year after I um, took her um, English writing class. And then I didn't have time in my schedule then, but I was really interested. So about a year later, when I had a, an opening in my schedule, I contacted her again and then I got involved and started teaching there. Uh, both semester I taught at Perryville, the women's prison. Um, so 
so far. I've just started that. I also do some tutoring while I'm there as well. So um, there's five students at Perryville who I work with on and off. Um, sometimes I teach the class with Colleen. Sometimes I just help out with general subject tutoring on if they're preparing for their GEDs or if they're taking another class, and I help them with that as well. Cool. Hi guys, my name is Chandler Fritz. I'm a senior here studying English and philosophy. I have taught, but I'm not currently teaching, unfortunately, at uh, Florence Prison and Adobe Mountain uh, Juvenile Facility. I taught creative writing for a few years um, with a co-partner and then also as a teaching assistant at Adobe Mountain. I got involved because I just wanted some teaching experience and teaching in prisons was open to any major. Uh, in any school, so I reached out to Corey and um, got plugged into Florence and then was there for a semester and taught over the summer and for another semester at uh, the juvenile facility, which I enjoy quite a bit. So. Hi, my name's Amalia Handler and I'm here representing um, the biology class, uh, which is taught in um, Iman, currently in Rining Unit and also a geology, astronomy, and planetary science class, which is just getting started this semester. Um, it's my third year teaching with biology, and um, these two classes have a pretty different format from a lot of the other ASU classes in that they're team taught. So we have a team of over uh, 12 graduate students and undergraduates in each class, um, and each individual class is team taught by two of the instructors from that group, um, and we rotate so that um, people can teach classes about topics that they're particularly interested in or have some area of expertise in particular. Um, so just keep that, I, I'm, I'm representing many different perspectives uh, as my point on the panel today. Wonderful, thank you guys, and thank you for being here. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so I thought we'd start off with first talking about um, how you guys structure your classes, um, what you guys you know put into this every week, and how you lead in a class where resources are limited and um, you know classes sometimes are unexpectedly canceled. You know we'll show up sometimes and um, we you know we're told that class is canceled for varying reasons. Um, but yeah, so I thought we'd start with that. So my first question is, do you have more lecture-based, activity-based, or discussion-based classes? And what strategies have you found helpful in engaging your students with the course material? And then Sarah, I thought you could talk a little bit about how you typically respond to the incarcerated students with Penn Project um, and what you provide them in terms of feedback. Also, I don't know if someone explained the Penn Project. Did I miss that? Um, for those of you who don't know, the Penn Project is a um, distance learning course where ASU students um, respond to written work received from incarcerated students. So they send us short fiction stories, um, poems, songs, that sort of thing, and we respond with tools to help them better their writing. So. Do, I, do I start? Okay. Yes. Um, so my, I teach writing, so it's definitely more um, hands-on. Um, what I've found has worked most effectively with my students um, is to just bring in a lot of well-written um, articles. I'm mostly focused on nonfiction and journalism, like I said. So I just bring in a ton of articles that I enjoyed reading, and um, we discuss them because I think um, one of the issues for a lot of um, encouragement people is that there's not access to um, maybe current reading material or to the sorts of things that um, they want to read. And so I try and be that conduit to provide access to those um, sorts of things. And um, I think we, you know, do a lot of reading and we do a lot of um, in-class activities um, where uh, we do peer-to-peer uh, -peer editing, and then I also will work with students um, in the classroom. Um, and I think one of the things that I have started integrating into my um, classes too is a focus on like one final written project. So um, maybe that's a really well-written letter to a family member, or maybe that's a really well-written um, personal essay that we spend three months um, editing um, so that they can like walk away with something that they can feel really proud of um, and then um, even potentially get 
there's various opportunities to publish incarcerated people's writing, and so I work with them to, to try and um, make that a possibility, too. So I've taught two different courses. The first one was business skills. For that class, we originally had a syllabus that had structured um, lectures for each week, but we found that the students were a lot more receptive to working mostly on their resume building skills. So they really liked to be able to work on their resumes outside of class or in class and then bring them in for my co-teacher and I to edit and go through it with them, really see all of their mistakes so that they can make those edits and bring them back and also practicing interview skills directly, um, really being able to give them that feedback was really helpful for them. And kind of to go off what Mia said, they really appreciated being able to walk away from the class with a written resume um, and feeling like they had those interview skills that they could use when they were released. For the psychology class that we're teaching, it's a little bit different. Um, for that class, we do a lot of discussion-based activities. We've done half lecture, half Socratic seminar style. We like to kind of break up the class into um, lecture and then discussion, lecture and discussion, and give them a break in the middle just so they don't feel overwhelmed by all of that information. And we find that they're able to pair their experiences within prison with what we're actually teaching them in psychology. So that's what we've found to be very beneficial for them. Um, with all of my responses to um, incarcerated students, I really try to find a balance between giving them examples of work that relates to what they submitted, um, kind of like Mia said, being that conduit for um, access to like current poems and current essays and current works that they might not otherwise be able to read and reference um, as they're going through their own writing process. So it depends on you know, what they've submitted, whether it's a poem or an essay or um, an article, or sometimes it's even a letter. Depending on what the format is, I try to cater directly to that, whether it's talking about specific literary devices or how it's structured. Um, but I always try to find that balance between this is what um, a student did great in their work and this is what could be improved and here's an example of where it's done well in another piece. Um, and just really giving them validation for the work that they've submitted <coughs> in addition to you know, tips and tricks to help them improve upon that in future drafts. So when I taught um, Chinese last semester, I focus every single class on really trying to make it as interactive as possible, um, mainly because it's a really big obstacle to learning when, first of all, it's only a once a week class. So I teach them Chinese. They don't speak Chinese for the entire week, I mean, for, for obvious reasons. Um, and then it's really hard to retain a lot of that. And that's just, the, that's just an obstacle that comes along with not being able to teach them and interact with the language on a daily basis. So I really try and make it as interactive as possible, do activities that they can remember, um, and hopefully maybe even use in, as they're walking around, just like little things. Um, it's kind of exciting when you see an object in real life and you can say that object in a different language. Um, so pointing out little things, being really interactive with the game, um, games or activities that we did, um, and also just lots of repetition with those activities. Um, so you know, another obstacle is that you, you can't really bring in, I can't leave like a recorder device so they can remember how to say those things, so it's easy to forget. So I really try and repeat it, have them speak, do a lot of speaking exercises. Um, and that's how I like to stru structure my classes, just in a way that makes it really memorable. And hopefully, even if they don't remember one thing, there was just like a couple of exciting things they learned. Like they, they learned how to say the word like awesome in Chinese. And so by the end of the class, they would be able to say that one thing and they'd be able to express how awesome everything was and that, that made me happy. Um, so just making it interactive was, for Chinese, learning a new language was, was my goal and making it memorable. Cool. Um, teaching creative writing is, is a lot of fun in, uh, in, prisons, in the prison system. Um, I taught uh, a couple styles. Uh, at Florence, I just did kind of a basic writing workshop. Um, so we 
workshop pieces uh, that students bring in. We're talking about them all together. It's like 90% praising the piece, 10% constructive criticism, um, and it's cool. It, it kind of brings everyone together. A workshop is, it, it's certainly like a bonding opportunity for people because you have to be really vulnerable to share your written work, fiction, or, or nonfiction. And then when I got into the juvenile system, um, I wanted to teach something that just interested the students. Uh, and well, nine out of 10 of the students maybe aren't reading like E.E. E. Cummings or T.S. Eliot or other boring dead white guys. Those same nine of 10 are writing like rap lyrics every day. Um, and I'm not super fluent in that literary genre, but uh, if you couldn't tell by the everything about me, right? Um, but I, I knew slam poetry pretty well, and so I said, okay, well why don't we just drop the music and uh, write your lyrics in the form of a slam poem? You know, free verse, playing verse doesn't have to have like a sonnet rhyming pattern. And, and so I did the same workshop with them, but doing slam poetry instead, and it turned out to be a lot of fun. It could be uh, lyrical, it could be humorous. Um, there was a lot of freedom for them to, to choose what their subject was gonna be, and a lot of them did personal narratives just in the form of a slam poem, and I was teaching them things like, you know, uh, different literary subjects, literary tools that you would use, but also pre keeping it pretty open for them. Um, and at the end of the year, we do a, a performance, which they enjoy quite a bit. Um, and nothing gives you more satisfaction than watching like some student who just hated poetry at the beginning of the year get up and read a poem. Um, it's a lot of fun. So. so again, coming from um, uh, science background, uh, we started off in biology in a maximum security unit at Iman, and uh, when the class first started, it was entirely lecture-based. And then sort of slowly over time, we started incorporating more and more activities. And now I'm happy to say five years on and in a different unit, every one of our lessons includes some kind of non-lecture-based activity. Um, so that's been a really fun evolution uh, to be part of. And um, Another consequence of switching units, uh, we're now at Rhining Unit, which is a lower security level. We've been able to bring in some non-paper um, materials in order to facilitate a whole new class of activities, which is really, really exciting. So, for example, we have a um, sorting activity where we bring in just a bunch of different random objects, paper clips, crumpled up pieces of paper, a tiny little piece of fabric, and we have the students group the things, just a, a collection of eight different things, and then we talk about did they group them based on what type of material it was or what the function of the particular object was or um, maybe uh, how you categorize it or where you would buy that material or things like that, and then we talk about how Things are really multidimensional in a lot of different ways, and biology is similar in that, in terms of we have to uh, organize all organisms some way, and we have to figure out how to um, decide which of these factors to consider when we're grouping things together. Um, another fantastic thing that we've been able to incorporate now being at a lower security unit and being a science class in biology is we're doing labs now. So for the first time last year, we incorporated a um, seed germination experiment uh, that was done over a two week long period where the students grow um, pea shoots under different light conditions and measure um, how quickly those shoots grow when exposed to different kinds of light. Uh, and we were able to do that lab again this year, and um, I'm excited to point out one of my co-teachers, Cassandra Barrett, I don't know if she's still around, is um, working on developing another lab this year. And with any luck, we'll have an additional two labs to implement. So it's really exciting to see how um, the evolution of the uh, engagement in the classroom. And another piece that we've been working on outside of the classroom is having students do individual research projects where they pick a topic that they're interested in at the start of the year and they spend uh, the entire year uh, researching that with materials that we bring in. Um, and then that culminates in a final written and oral presentation on the topic. Um, so it's been a very neat evolution. So as I mentioned earlier, um, our resources are often limited um, for mostly obvious reasons. Um, and 
while they can be in place for um, good reasons, it can sometimes hinder what we are able to do in the classroom, um, maybe make our teaching experience a little difficult or, and, or the um, learning experience for the students um, if they're not given you know, what you would normally get in like a classroom at a university, for example. Um, so I'm curious, if you were given the option of making some big changes to your teaching experience, um, what would you do? And obviously, you know, within reason, but what's something that would better your teaching experience and the student's learning experience? Um, well, I mean, I don't know if this is really within reason, but the, <laughs> the thing that really complicates um, my teaching, for example, is that um, I teach during a time where they do count. So um, in the prison, they have to count all of the prisoners multiple times a day and make sure that they are where they're supposed to be. Um, and so because my class happens when count is happening and people are supposed to be in their cells, um, we have to uh, do an out count, which means you have to register all the inmates who are in your class. And then it's always just kind of a mess trying to get that together. So I always find I have two hours to teach and the first half hour is um, doing the out count and finding this inmate from this yard and this inmate is over in this yard and they're not letting her through and then so it's just like kind of a lot and then it's like you always have to have your radio on um to you know see if they're they need to contact you the ceo the correctional officers need to contact you for any reason and then it's you're trying to teach writing and and connect with students over their writing and then it's just this constant radio noise that's in the background so i think that that environment um can make it a little little bit hard sometimes, but I also think that um, the thing that has like saved me as a teacher is that all of my students have always just been super adaptable and helpful and they understand the environment and um, we just, uh, we make it work as best as we can. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's what I would say. I will echo what Mia said because pill line and commissary are both during my class. So the inmates are in and out with trash bags full of Pop-Tarts and graham crackers and that's way more important than my psychology class. And I completely understand it, but it is frustrating. Um, and then needing to get their pills and hopping in in class. So that's kind of irritating, but I understand the system behind that. Probably the biggest thing for me moving from a minimum security unit last year to now Lumley, which is a medium maximum security unit, is noticing that every single time I come to class, something in the room is different. The first week we were there, we had a whiteboard. So the next week we brought markers and we're planning to use the whiteboard and draw things out. And then the next week the whiteboard was gone and the desks were in order. And then the next week the desks were in a completely different position. And I just wish that everything would stay the same so that I could stick with the curriculum that I planned before I came in. But it is part of the fun coming in to see what will happen that day. Yeah, Lumley is like that. I teach in Lumley too. And I teach writing without, we don't have desks or any tables. So um, that's the inmates also learn skills of how to write on your lap. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, Lumley's fun. <laughs> um, well, as an online instructor, I do not face those challenges, but I would say there are some difficulties in terms of like continuity. We get a lot of submissions. Um, everyone is just, they love to write. We get so many poems, so many stories, and um, it's always amazing to respond to those, but in some ways it would be nice to also be able to respond to one student, you know, for a few cycles at a time on one piece that they've really been working on and to not only get their piece, but get to hear their thought process behind this is why I made these changes or this is why maybe I decided to completely scrap this part. Um, it's very limited and we get uh, cover sheets we get and we get the piece and so we really do have to get creative with providing activities and providing examples and I you know I don't know what's within reason but if there was some way to integrate more whether it's like a video where there's like almost gapped notes or more um, activities that you can't write on a piece of paper um, that would be definitely beneficial. I think the changes that I would make are 
really similar to what's already been said, mainly that. Um, <laughs> Okay, so when I when I was in teaching Chinese last semester, I was in one unit um, called Pedro, and when I went to that unit, um, there's a couple of working chairs, um, and there's uh, some desks, uh, and then the whiteboard. There there is a whiteboard, but um, it's there's a lot of marking on it that you can't erase. So every single week, um, it was a, it was a small struggle to uh, ask the the woman there to grab me some little whiteboards. Um, and then I bring my own markers and everything. Um, and so that was a struggle and, and the classroom was, was not in very good condition. Um, it, it, was, it was in very bad condition. Um, <laughs> um, so that was a struggle, it's just, it's just that um, the range of resources I had to find by myself and prepare for, um, it, it really wasn't there. Now I'm teaching in a different unit, which is also still in Perryville, the same um, compound. Um, but I walked on the first week I had taught there, I, I walked into this beautiful classroom with like inspirational signs and, and desks. So it's very different. I wish there was maybe some, um, a little bit of continuity in terms of the resources they had, especially basic resources like being able to write on a board. Um, it's really hard to show Chinese characters and how to write things and how to say things with, without um, even the simplest visual um, tools at all. Um, beyond that, I don't, I don't think my, I would like to have more like technological access. I don't know if that's reasonable at all for me to, to ask that. But it's really hard because um, nowadays, if you want to search something up in a different language, you have Google Translate and you have phone apps, um, which include the entire dictionary of Chinese words that is the Chinese language. Um, you don't carry around massive dictionaries. So if I wanted to give massive dictionaries, that wouldn't be very reasonable. And But I also can't have any way for them to look up and learn by themselves, which is really how people learn the language. Um, they're constantly learning and looking things up like that. Um, so with that, you know, having that limited technological access is, um, yeah, it's really limiting for, for learning. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, I definitely experienced all these things at, at Florence for sure. Um, I do want to take a second though to praise the Adobe Mountain access that you get because we have uh, video, uh, computers, like whiteboards. It's just a dream coming from Florence. Uh, it was amazing. So I get to show like you know videos of of slam poets like performing and um, and all sorts of stuff. So. It's, it's amazing. I uh, can't use staples. No, I found that out the hard way. Um, definitely cannot staple pages together. But uh, I think, I mean, honestly, it's not something I would change. It's just like, I'll tell you a difficulty of the job, especially with creative writing, that I totally understand why these restrictions are in place. But with creative writing, you know, the best poetry and fiction is personal and uh, often has sensitive material. And Dipping our toes into those areas is, is very, the, those waters are very difficult to na navigate um, in the classroom. So um, it's not something I would change necessarily because I understand it's a necessary part, but it's it's the biggest difficulty for sure of, you know, when you have to tell a student, uh, even though your writing might be great here and even though, you know, this might be an important train of thought or important narrative for you to investigate on your own, we can't really bring this up in class. Um, and without time to necessarily do one-on-one -on -one, um, tutoring, at least at least for my schedule. It's hard to help students uh, develop some narratives that are really important to them that we just, it's not appropriate probably to share in the class. So that's the biggest difficulty for me and something I wish I had an opportunity to work around somehow. So I think for biology and geology, one of the skills that we're getting really good at is how to adjust our schedule at sort of any time. <laughs> so. Uh, Inevitably working in a prison, sometimes you find out a few days beforehand, sometimes you find out when you show up that the unit's on lockdown or that there's been a training scheduled or something like that, and for whatever reason, we can't teach that week. Um, and so in um, biology, certainly, and uh, in the geology class, they're getting used to this as well, this idea of um, if, if a class is canceled, there are still sort of a finite number of classes that we can offer in a given semester. And so we're getting pretty good at figuring out how to take, for example, two classes and combine them into one sort of condensed class that hopefully covers the big concepts in two topics. Or one thing that we've done in biology is take a progression of three classes and condense those down to two. Um, and 
in terms of just building these strategies for how do we make sure that we're still being true to all the content that we the, that we want to cover and and give the students some exposure to without necessarily getting to be there for all the hours that we would like to be there. And then I would say um, the other big challenge that we're thinking about is. Um, that we would love to get to a place where someday we understand there are a lot of barriers to um, offering some kind of credit for the students to get some kind of recognition for their really hard efforts in these classes. Um, and uh, there are a lot of barriers um, to making that possible, but um, we aspire to one day, the biology program at least has been going for five years, so I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and so I hope that we'll still be around when that day comes. Um, but certainly one of the things that I think is the biggest challenge to that right now is we only have an hour and a half with our students once a week. And for most undergraduate, biology classes, you would probably have three hours of classes a week plus a lab on top of that. Um, so really thinking about how um, in this system we can attain that much class time in order to get through all the material that's typically covered in an undergraduate class um, is really challenging. And one of the ways that we've, we've tried to do that in biology is taking a undergraduate class and splitting that up over an entire year-long process. Uh, instead of trying to do it all in a semester. So at an hour and a half over two semesters, you get to that kind of three hours a week sort of level. Um, but we're still thinking about uh, how do we incorporate more of these labs when sometimes that's at the sacrifice of more material that we'd like to cover. And Amalia, I'm glad you brought that last part up about um getting credit for these classes. Um, so I'm actually gonna jump to um, one of the questions I had kind of pertaining to that. Um, so since for a lot of our classes you can't get um, college credit for it, uh, I'm curious how you guys assess student learning. Um, do you guys use grades or other types of assessments? Um, and how has your assessment style changed over time? Um, seeing like what they do, how do you, do you, is it something you give out each week or is it something you just assess on your own um, by the end of the semester? And then, Sarah, I was wondering if you can talk about how your responses to your students have changed over time with Penn as well. Um, yeah, so my students, um, I uh, basically my class, although they don't get credit, students can, um, they get a certificate for um, keeping, for passing the class, um, which is actually um, very important to a, a lot of them. Um, and that's something that they could go use if they're like in a parole board or something like that. Um, or also um, some of them, it's just cool to be able to show their families or just, you know, have something like that. So you can pass my class, um, you pass the class or you can pass with honors or you can pass with high honors. And um, the difference between those three levels um, are based on um, attendance and um, people who are, are turning in assignments. So it's really hard because some of my students, like I have taught students with um, advanced degrees in journalism and writing. And then I've also taught students who haven't graduated from um, eighth grade. So it's not really, um, fair or I think useful to assess um, everyone on the same uh, exact strict rubric. I think it's like seeing a progression of students. So that's what I try and do. Like if I can tell that there's a student who really doesn't have the baseline writing skills, but who is really trying to write something, then, you know, they're going to, you know, I'm going to grade them based off of that um, progression. And so I think, um, like one of the most powerful moments for me was um, at the end of a class I taught like three semesters ago, um, we did a award ceremony and gave everyone um, their certificates. And um, uh, one of the students came up to me afterwards and she was just like crying, like bawling. And um, she said, you know, I, uh, have never graduated anything in my life with honors. And this certificate says high honors and you don't know how much that means to me. And then of course I started crying because <laughs> I'm like gonna start crying thinking about it. And that's like another hard thing is that in that moment, like the only thing that I wanted to do was like give her a hug, right? But like I couldn't even shake her hand or like pat her on the back because that's against the rules. Um, and so, yeah, but I think, I think the students who are in our classes are doing it because they legitimately want 
to learn and they're going to take advantage of any single opportunity that that you give them and so i think it's it's about like seeing a progression of students and meeting them where they're at so I do certificates for my classes as well. Um, a year ago when I was teaching business skills, one of the biggest things was for all of the students to have a fully written resume at the end of the course. And then we also completed mock interviews. So as long as they at least attempted to write a resume, had a clean copy that they handed to us, and then participated in the mock interviews and attended a certain number of percentage of classes, they were given a certificate. And I will say I do honors, high honors distinction too, and almost all of them graduate with the highest one because they come to almost every single class. The only reason they don't come is if they have like a 115 degree fever. Um, and then this semester I'm doing certificates as well. We don't really have any written work in that class. It's more based off of discussion. So we do student participation as long as they're participating in discussion, listening to discussion, taking notes in class and come to the classes, they'll get the certificates as well. Um, after doing pen project for several semesters, I definitely learned how to approach pieces differently, um, especially their def incarcerated students have various degrees of education, and so you can tell with the writing whether it's someone's first attempt at a poem or whether someone has submitted dozens and dozens of short stories. And so you do really want to cater to those students and you know, you're not going to give someone a definition of personification if they've gotten dozens and dozens of responses. So it's how do you take what they're putting into their writing and how do you get them, those students to expand on that. And so I do stress um, revision a lot more in my responses now than I think I did previously, especially getting pieces from some of the same students um, over the course of the five semesters. I really encourage going back to those pieces and thinking about how they could improve upon them or change them completely and um, in the hopes that they'll resubmit for a revision of that piece. Um, I think that's an important aspect of learning is critiquing your own work and taking someone's own, taking someone else's um, critiques and praises of your work and doing that on your own, on your own time. In my class, at least last semester, I did not ever formally assess any of the students that were there. And the reason being is that it's really hard to, um, for, at least in, in Chinese, for me to demand that they remember specific characters or words without really any resources. And also because I just really wanted to encourage learning on their own and learning how to learn the language rather than making sure that they could <coughs> recite Confucius proverbs. Um, but the point is, it was more important to me that they knew how to learn the language. So um, I think, I, don't, I found out later that this is not normal for most classes, but um, what would happen was I would go to my class, they would announce it over some speaker, and then I would have like different students almost every week. Um, I would have like the same set of six main students who would come every week, but there was always four new people. And I, I just always said to them, you're welcome to come in as long as you're serious about learning. And I never had a problem with it. Um, and, and I never took, really had to formally assess them because I felt that they were all really serious, um, really, really wanting to learn Chinese, even if they had a hard time retaining it, uh, even though that those that were the first time coming, they would jump in and attempt to say a tongue twister in Chinese, um, which was which was <laughs> awesome. Um, and so that, that was my experience. It was more for me about teaching them how you can go home um, when they do have resources um, to look up a character, learn know how to pronounce it on their own, and then um, learn it learn it independently rather than trying to assess how much they can memorize over time, um, which likely if you don't practice it for more than a week or two, it, it loses it slowly. So learning how to do it was more important for me. At, uh, at Adobe, I'm assigned to a teacher and it's, it's very much, it's a, it's a high school setting. So students have multiple classes every day and uh, they get get graded on things, and so I'm not directly involved in the grading. I know a lot of students uh, can earn their either GED or, or high school diploma as well, correct? Yeah. Um, and I, I will say this, the one thing that I am 
actively kind of always trying to encourage students is the, is the pursuit of college um, afterwards. For a lot of these kids, they have pretty am amazing opportunities that the state can help them through, uh, through CPS and through other programs to get them um, some, a pretty decent amount of college funding. Um, so getting their diploma and getting students to like achieve as much as they can in classes is a huge deal, I know, to the whole staff, and, and it, it was in our class. So um, I know uh, for at least the assignments I'm assigning, it's, it's all completion. I mean, it's, it's poetry. It's on, I'm not going to grade. That's a good poem. It's a bad poem. Um, so as long as the students are getting their poems in on time and are you know, participating in class, then um, they're groovy for, for my grade book. But uh, yeah, I, I know in all the other classes, it's, it's you know, that you get formal grades and whatnot. But uh, for poetry and for, and for creative writing as well, this is how it was at Florence. It was just turning things in. That's how it is at ASU. It's not, there's, you won't find creative writing classes that give like, that's an A plus story. That's a B plus story. At least you don't find that much anymore. So, so in biology, it's been quite a progression. When the class got started, um, before I was involved in the program, there were no grades or formal assessments of any kind, and that was really driven by um, the um, concern that if we did grade the students, then somehow we would be interfering with a hierarchy in the classroom or something like that. We just didn't want to set up any kind of hierarchy. And um, the interesting thing is that since I've been involved with the program, we have been doing grades and have been introducing more and more material that are graded. So for example, I saw the progression from assigning homework and getting it graded to exams and getting it graded. And now the biology class has a whole research project component to it, which is graded as well. Um, and that has actually been an interesting equalizer in the classroom uh, where um, I think that students have, for the most part, responded enthusiastically to getting graded. And um, the idea of uh, introducing some level of objectivity into the assessment by um, having a rubric and everybody gets graded against the same rubric has been an interesting sort of equalizer in the classroom environment. So I'm really grateful that it's something that um, we've incorporated with and we tell them at the end of the semester what their final grade is for the class. Um, and so we found that to be an interesting uh, motivator in terms of participation in the classroom. Um, and then we do a lot of informal assessment as well. We meet because we have a team teaching model in both the biology and the um, geology, astronomy, and planetary science class, uh, when we have our team meetings once a week um, outside of the prison, we talk very actively about um, the extent to which students are engaged in the class and you know, at what points were they um, super into what we were doing and at what points uh, was, were their eyes more glazed over and um, we do that in our assessments as well. And so it's been a really useful tool for us to update how we teach the classes in terms of figuring out where are the real sticking points and um, where do we need to do better in terms of going over material. So all of these classes are um optional, except I would say for Adobe, is that right, Chandler? Right. That the students are required to go? Right, so I mean, I think we'd all say that they want to be there and they're happy to be there. Um, I know last week when, or two weeks ago, um, one of my students asked me if um, I was like just never going to show up at some point, just stop coming. And I was like, no, like I wouldn't do that. If, unless I'm like dying, I will be here. And then of course the next week I get sick and I don't show up. I'm like, of course I say that the week I tell them before that I'll always be there. Um, but they're very eager to be there. And I'm curious, Chandler, if the, your students are the same way, if they're excited to be there or if you've had any experiences where you, know, you feel like they, they don't want to be there. I've had those experiences for sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, the students, by the most part, uh, the students that were in my class were pretty high-performing students uh, within Adobe Mountain, so um, 9 out of 10 of the students were, were excited to be there every day. Um, it, I mean, this is any classroom, I, I suppose. You get students who don't want to be there and um, uh, who are not programming, uh, is the lingo, and uh, I learned. <laughs> and um, yeah, th but there's... Uh, like I said, there's, I mean, there's a huge drive at Adobe to, to be performing well because that's that's 
part of your ticket out is to do well in your classes. So, and and you can you can only benefit yourself from performing well in these classes. So, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's it's as big of a difficulty as it might sound like mm -hmm. having forcing students to take these classes because it'd be similar to any high school in that way. Right. Yeah. All right. So for the sake of time, I'm going to ask one more question, then open up to the floor to hear if you guys have any questions. Um, so. Obviously, you know, we teach in prisons and we work with incarcerated students and to many that sounds very far-fetched and um, I'm sure you guys probably have stories of people's reactions like what did you just say? Like what do you do with your weekends? And that just sounds very um, strange and I, you know, one day I hope that we live in a world where that isn't strange. Um, it's the norm. And so I'm curious what's a question, reaction, or comment you often get when they find out that you teach at a prison or that you um, work with incarcerated students to uh, provide them feedback for their work. Um, and what did you, what would you wish people knew um, so that they wouldn't have these preconceived notions and would, wouldn't find this strange and wouldn't think, oh, like, is this safe? You know, what are you doing? Um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely gotten the, like, safety reaction, like, oh, do you ever feel dangerous, whatever. I mean, one of my students is on death row, and I don't feel, I've never felt threatened by her um, or anyone in my classes. Um, I think... One of the things that I really don't like, I'm a, I'm a journalist and so language is really important to me. And I personally really don't like uh, the word inmate um, because like a lot of people will ask me, well, like what are the inmates like that you work with? And I understand the need for the term um, inmate like on the institutional level. Um, I, you know, ADC and the people who work in ADC do a, a really, really difficult work with um, everyone who is in that prison, not just the select group of people who want to participate in optional educational programming. So I totally understand that term in a more institutional context. Um, outside, I think, and in, in, in general, I think that that term is really dehumanizing. Um, and I think that one of the reasons that we have the problems with a huge prison system and problems with recidivism that we do is that um, we don't treat incarcerated people or people who have been incarcerated as people. Um, and we put these labels like inmates and felons um, that are honestly just scary words that don't have a lot of meaning. Um, and so I think, you know, if there's one thing that, that I could change about the public in general, um, it, it would be, I, I think that terminology is important and that in the way that we think and talk about uh, the prison system, we need to recognize that there is a lot of humanity um, that exists within that system and a lot of people's lives are affected and it's important to, to emphasize that side of it, I think. I will agree that most of the comments I get when I mention teaching in prison is um, safety. People ask if the students are dangerous and how do you feel with all these people that are, are locked down. And honestly, I can say that I feel safer in my prison classes than I do in a lot of my ASU classes, um, especially with the mass shootings that have been very common in a lot of major universities. Um, there's been times when I've been sitting in a class and I hear loud bangs just from outside from cars or construction or a loud door and I do genuinely get scared just because you see on the news all of these things that, that happen and it could happen here. Um, so that's something that crosses my mind a lot when I'm sitting in large lecture hall classes and I can say that within prison, that's not something that I've been afraid of. I haven't been afraid of my students and I haven't been afraid for my safety there. And that's a big difference between teaching in prison and going to class as a student here that I think a lot of people don't think about. Um, but that's something that I've noticed as a teacher there. Um, being on the other side of a computer screen, I didn't ever think I would get a response of, are you ever concerned for your safety? But actually recently I was having a conversation about um, responding to incarcerated students and she was so hung up on 
well, what if they know who you are? What's gonna happen? And it's like, well, even after explaining, you know, the process and how we get these pieces of writing and how we respond with, you know, a pen name and how we don't know the backstory of students and we, we get, just get what we're told from them. She was so concerned and just worried and I, it was frustrating to me because I just was so excited to talk about the learning that was happening and how important it was that they were able to share their voice and their story um, with you know someone they've never met and everyone wants to express something important and giving someone that opportunity even if it's you know I'm just such a small part of it that's incredibly special to me and you know this platform to give to allow incarcerated students to really express their voice I think is just the most important thing to focus on and when people get hung up on the safety or what may have put these students um, and led them to be incarcerated in the first place. That's not the point. And I wish that after having conversations about Penn Project, this wasn't so prevalent, but unfortunately it is. And you know, a lot of what Mia said changing, just um, how we talk about it and expressing that is just so crucial. I don't have too much to add. Um, I, I think that I, I really just echo the same things. Um, the only thing that I, I really think is important to emphasize is the students that I work with, and I'm, and I'm, everyone, everyone here has expressed similar things, um, almost all of them are really engaged, uh, highly intellectual. Um, they learn, they want to learn, and they really, really try hard. This is, um, and I taught my class at, uh, at 8, 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Compare that to any college class that you see at 8 a.m., um, at least 50% of the students are not nearly as engaged, um, part participating or even functioning, for that matter, um, at, at that time of day. And, and the students that I have, 99% of them are ready to learn, learning quickly. They're not learning any slower than you would, than you would think that if you went to a college and trying their best to get the most out of it. And so it's easy to put a label on um, prison institutions as a place where you know, these people are, must have problems, they're slower, absolutely not true. Um, I've had an experience just viewing them as people that are trying to learn and doing their best and a lot of the times they surprise you by how, uh, how quickly they learn and how good they are at picking up on the things that you're teaching them. Yeah, I have a story. Uh, uh, so my dad's a pastor at like a pretty decent sized church. And one time he like offhandedly mentioned uh, to someone as to why I wasn't at an event because my son's at prison right now. Uh, and like a flood of emails came in over the next like week and a half of, of, uh, of whatever condolences or something. But um, yeah, I mean, people, it's definitely, there's just misperceptions that everyone's come down the line that's mentioned. And uh, I, the thing that I, try to stress to other ASU students is like just how amazing of an opportunity it is also for us to go in there and and I mean I, I just wanted to find teaching experience and I got that in so much more if you want to learn how to be a, like a high school teacher there's a few better ways places to learn classroom management than teaching at a Tony Mountain High School and like in a juvenile facility um, and so I, it, yeah it's it's an op I mean obviously it's an amazing opportunity to serve underserved uh, people and people who deserve this type of access to education, but just don't get it unless, unless you know, we're having volunteers that go in and deliver it to them. So, um, yeah, it's, it's awesome for both parties involved. It's just an amazing, enriching experience, so. Um, I think maybe the most pertinent information to share here, because these folks have already gone over a lot of things that I think are very relevant to both of the classes that I participate in, is, um, our mission statement, which has evolved over the years, and um, Stephen Hart, my co-leader, um, goes over this with every person that he interviews who wants to get involved in the biology program. And um, our priorities for the class are in order of importance, normalizing a classroom environment, um, empowering students to become curators of their own education, and basic knowledge in biology or astronomy, geology, and planetary science 
as living organisms, they're going to be interested in biology in one way or another, and as citizens of the planet, they're going to be interested in the uh, environment around them, how that formed, and their relationship to the sun and the stars in, the, in this incredible galaxy that we live in. Um, and then one other thing to maybe echo is that um, we have a mixture of both graduate students and undergraduate students that are involved in both of these programs. And um, one of the interesting things that we talked about recently is the different reasons that um, undergraduates versus graduate students get involved in the program. Um, and I would say we're all motivated by a point that Chandler just made of um, just wanting to make education uh, something that's available to as many people as possible, even folks that wouldn't necessarily or can as easily get access to um, education resources. Um, but one of the things that the graduate students in our team talks a lot about is getting teaching experience. And one of the huge motivators for me in terms of being part of this group and continuing my involvement is just being with a big team of really, really enthusiastic individuals that get together once a week and we all talk about something that we're really excited about and are all collaborating on how to best do whatever it is we do, um, which in this particular case just so happens to be teaching a science class in a prison. So I lied, just before we open it up to the floor, uh, I just wanna end on a positive note and um, hear if you guys have any stories, I know some of you already shared a few moments, um, just about exciting moments you've had or um, maybe your students have had like an epiphany or where everything just seemed to click for them or anything like that. If you don't have one, that's fine. Um, yeah, I have one that happened to me today because this morning I went to teach my class um, right before I came here. And um, there was a student who, um, we were talking about our proposals for the final um, project that they do. And um, she, uh, her proposal was um, writing something about her sister who had died um, several years ago and she said that she had stopped writing when um, her sister had died because she didn't feel like she could do it, that the grief was too um, strong for her surrounding that event. And she um, told me that in this class she was going to finally try and start writing about that um, so that she could process it. And so I think that was a, a really powerful um, example of just how um, providing these opportunities and encouraging people to write and express themselves through writing um, can really be uh, kind of life-changing. I mean, she like started crying in class today because she was just kind of overwhelmed and, and just excited with the ability to finally be able to express um, these things that she had been holding in for a long time. For me, the most exciting thing was last year when the students were working on their resumes. A lot of them felt like their time within prison was completely wasted, that they didn't really have anything that they could use to put on their resumes during that time. And a lot of them had only ever been in the system, so they didn't have work experience. They didn't know what they were gonna talk about. And really teaching them to use the things that they have done in prison to show the skills that they've made by either being firefighters or working in the kitchen or cleaning and just showing that you could use those skills to show that you can get a job outside was so exciting to watch them create a resume just from their experiences in prison and, and the excitement in their faces and seeing that they felt hope to come out and, and be able to do something with their lives was probably the biggest thing for me. Um, we get, I mentioned earlier, we get so many responses from um, many different incarcerated students and often everyone is just so excited to share their work that every piece is a new one. Um, and I know a lot of writers don't like making revisions to their work. It's hard, no one likes coming back, which it could be good the first time. Um, but one of the first pieces of feedback that I received from my responses to um, the incarcerated students' pieces is someone who told me that they had never once gone back to a piece that they had written, but after learning some new things and seeing where their piece could grow, was so excited 
to resubmit the piece um, for a second draft. And just knowing that, you know, whether it was just one comment in my response that maybe helped that was, was really powerful and re uh, honestly kind of kept me dedicated to this program over the semester is just knowing that there's a few sparks that really keep people's interests alive. Um, and seeing that just someone wanted to make a second draft led to that. Um, I feel a little awkward because my experience was not quite as profound. <laughs> um, but um, so, because in learning Chinese, um, I've never, it's, it's more about them learning and a lot of the skills that they take are understandably not going to be ones that they're going to remember in terms of like actually speaking and writing the language. I hope that they leave with an appreciation for the language and knowing that they can accomplish something that's really hard, right? Learning Chinese or any language for that matter is difficult and ha being able to accomplish that in the field to express themselves is a really big deal um, for them and I think for me also it's a big deal to see them grow and progress, um, even if they may not retain it for a really long period of time, and, and that's, that's normal. Um, but one small, small success is uh, at the end of the semester, uh, I think it's fun if they can leave with something personal they can take with them. So you print out a certificate um, and I give them a Chinese name based on characteristics they want about themselves. And so they leave with that, they love it, they're super excited. There are no tears, um, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, but they do love it and it's a really great experience to know that they left with something personal and something they can use and express about themselves in a different culture and language that they can bring with them. I had a student who was a uh, vocalist in a death metal band called Apocalypse with a K. Uh, wrote a poem about a dandelion, and that was that rocked my world. That was awesome. That was probably well, one of the coolest experiences I've had. Uh, I, but I, the slam poetry performances that we do at the end of the semester or at the end of the block every every time I've taught those have been the coolest. I mean, seeing the students up there performing and just realizing that they can do something that they never thought they could do before, which is not only speak in front of a huge group of people, but like recite their own poetry, which is the most terrifying thing in the world, uh, in front of a group and, and be praised for it and do a really awesome job at it. So I love that at, at the end of the year. So uh, one of our big classes in biology that we spend a lot of time preparing for is the evolution class, um, which last year I taught with Adele Crane, who's in the audience today. And um, it's a big class because uh, there are a lot of sort of preconceived notions about what evolution is from students when we walk into that class. And um, what is really awesome about that class is that we come into it at the end of a big, long section where the students have covered um, reproduction in organisms, genetics, uh, so how do organisms make offspring and where the do, do the genetics come from in those offspring and how do mutations occur and what are different types of genetic mutations and how do you get unique combinations of different genes, for example, that lead to offspring that have a different set of traits than their parents, for example. Um, so it's a really neat place to teach a class because they're coming in with basically more knowledge about uh, human reproduction and more generally how organisms reproduce than the average doe that you'll pull off the street. And then kind of all this preconceived notion and baggage and maybe keywords about evolution. And in that class, what we designed was a activity that sort of builds on those that knowledge base of how species reproduce and where genetic variation comes from. And we just argue with them that all we're adding to this framework that they're already experts on is how those organisms interact with the environment. And so we talk about how uh, there are certain pressures on organisms, not just based on their genetics, but based on interactions with predators, for example, or that a given ecosystem might have a specific carrying capacity. It can only hold so many individuals. And so we build up the lesson slowly that eventually leads to this natural conclusion that you must have evolution by natural selection if you accept that these are how organisms reproduce, which they're all experts on at this point. And then we're just adding that ecosystem component to it. And um, last year there was this big 
aha, I understand what evolution is now moment. And um, I'm really, really happy to report that uh, as of two weeks ago, Adele led that class uh, without my being there with a, a new person on our team as of this year and was able to create that exact same aha moment once again. So it wasn't a fluke. It's something that we're able to reproduce again and again. And that's been a really, really exciting thing for us. Awesome. Well, so I lied again. Um, we won't be able to open it up to the floor right now for questions just because we've gone a little over time. Um, but please do see our panelists after the conference. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you guys so much for being here and answering uh, these questions.